Some insane images there of the moment Taiwan's strongest earthquake in 25 years hit that island. You can see that building just folding like paper there. I'm Gotti Schwartz, and you're watching Stay Tuned Now. That 7.4 magnitude earthquake happened right around 8 in the morning local time, and the epicenter was right on the island's Pacific coast, followed by more than 200 aftershocks. As of now, at least nine people have been killed and a thousand more have been hurt, but officials are saying they expect the death toll to rise in the coming days. Now, when the initial quake hit, people were literally climbing out of windows of collapsed buildings to escape. Some, like this man right here, uh, was stuck in a pool when it was all happening. And right now, there are desperate search and rescue efforts underway to get people out of a lot of rubble there. Hundreds are feared trapped, including some 71 workers in two rock quarries, literally the last place you would want to be when an earthquake like this hits. They are fortunately safe, but the roads to get to them are impossible to get through right now. And NBC's Janice Mackie Freyer has more. Tonight, rescuers racing to reach those trapped after a massive earthquake in Taiwan, pulling people out of buildings, even out of vehicles, with authorities now focusing on getting to those still stuck under the rubble. With reports tonight, 71 workers are trapped in two mines. The earthquake struck during the morning rush hour, causing buildings to shake and sway. <laughs> this woman saying it felt like her house would collapse. The magnitude 7.4 quake jolting the island. Rooftop swimming pools churned, water pouring down this building. Video filmed inside a moving train showing huge landslides, items toppling off store shelves. The televisions in this newsroom started to shake. The most powerful earthquake to hit Taiwan in a quarter century. More than a thousand people are injured. Taiwan's president-elect saying, the top priority is to rescue people and get them treatment. The hardest hit area around Hualien, just 11 miles from the epicenter. That's where American Annie Lima was when it hit. Around 8 o'clock this morning and the whole world starts shaking. What was it like? It was pretty scary. In all the years that I've lived here and in Southern California before that, I felt a lot of earthquakes, but this was by far the strongest and the most frightening. And it just went on and on. I think it was close to two minutes. And as soon as the shaking stopped, we ran to get out of the apartment. Dozens of people are still trapped along roads, tunnels, and hiking trails cut off by landslides. In Hualien, some buildings now leaning precariously and crews already working to demolish them. Janice Mackie Freyer, thanks so much. Meanwhile, across the globe, there is a collective holding of breath from those thousands and thousands of companies that rely on microchips made in Taiwan as the world's most advanced chip makers pause some of those operations to check on some of the earthquake damage there. You remember, Taiwan is the world's choke point when it comes to all these microchips that power our phones, they power the cameras that we're using in the studio, probably the chips that are right now being used by your TV or computer to watch this. And we are talking about a manufacturing process that engineers billions and billions of transistors onto tiny pieces of silicone on the microscopic level. It's, it's this just next generation tech that's only done at the two and three nanometer level on that earthquake prone island and the world's most important chip maker, a company called Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing, had to pause its process and evacuate a lot of its workers as a precaution. And we know those chip fabs are built with some of the latest in seismic engineering, but did it all hold up perfectly? Because with such precision manufacturing, there is zero room for error, as we saw with those supply chain issues that sent ripple effects through the entire global economy during COVID. So far, fortunately, it is looking unlikely because the company is saying that it expects to resume operations a little later tonight. So that's some good news and we're going to keep an eye on it. But it's just another reminder on how precariously dependent our digital world has become on that island thousands of miles away. Meanwhile, over in Israel, an airstrike has led to some of the toughest words from President Joe Biden on the conflict yet saying he's, quote, outraged and heartbroken after a strike killed seven aid workers in Gaza, including a dual U.S. citizen, and insisting Israel better protect aid workers and civilians there. 
All seven victims worked for World Central Kitchen. In a new interview, founder and chef Jose Andres says he thinks his workers were targeted, quote, systematically car by car. This was not just a bad luck situation where, oops, uh, we dropped the bomb in the wrong place or, or no. This was over 1.5, 1.8 kilometers with a very defined humanitarian convoy that had signs in the top, in the roof, uh, a very colorful logo that we are obviously very proud of, but that, that's very clear who we are and what we do. NBC's international correspondent, Raf Sanchez, has more. The bodies of those slain seven World Central Kitchen aid workers have now crossed out of Gaza into Egypt as part of their long journey home for burial. They go with tributes from around the world, including from President Biden, who calls them fearless and brave, and it leveled some of the most serious criticism at Israel that we have seen from the president yet. He said simply, Israel is not doing enough to protect either civilians or aid workers, and that this is part of the reason that it has been so difficult to get aid distributed inside of the Gaza Strip is that it is simply not safe for humanitarians. The UN says the killing of these seven aid workers, not an isolated incident. Around 200 humanitarians have been killed in Gaza since the start of the war. The vast majority of them Palestinians. Among the seven World Central Kitchen staff who were identified overnight, 33-year-old Jacob Flickinger, he is a, was a dual U.S.-Canadian citizen who was part of the relief operation at World Central Kitchen. Now, the Israeli military making public the initial findings of its probe into this deadly series of airstrikes. They say this was a misidentification of those three World Central Kitchen vehicles. They say it happened at night in a complex wartime environment and that this is a tragic mistake which they deeply regret. But the Israeli military is facing a number of questions. World Central Kitchen says that its vehicles were clearly identified with its symbol and that it coordinated with the Israeli military about their movements ahead of time. The charity also telling NBC News that two days before the deadly airstrike, they believe an Israeli sniper shot at one of those vehicles. They say the bullet damaged a wing mirror. Nobody was hurt, but that they filed a complaint with the Israeli military. We asked the IDF about this shooting incident. They did not come back to us. This is having a major impact on the humanitarian mission inside of Gaza. World Central Kitchen has paused its own aid operations. We saw those three ships heading from Cyprus to Gaza, turning around and heading back. A number of other aid organizations also putting their operations inside of Gaza on pause. So this is a major blow to the humanitarian effort at a time when it is needed the most. Back to you. Raf Sanchez, thanks so much. And right now, a massive and dangerous storm system is making its way east after leaving a deadly path of destruction in the Midwest. At least two people that we know of are dead, and hundreds of thousands were left without power from storms that brought a trifecta of severe weather across several states. We are talking tornadoes, flooding, even blizzard-like conditions at times. And here's some numbers for you. At least 14 tornadoes were reported across six states in the past 24 hours. The twister is so powerful in some areas it destroyed entire buildings. In other communities, old trees were ripped out of the ground, falling onto cars. Kentucky and West Virginia are now under states of emergencies. Now, this widespread storm continues to bring all sorts of weather alerts to millions from, from Maine to Florida with particular concern over coastal and flash flooding. Areas like Pittsburgh have already seen some of the heaviest flooding. And NBC's meteorologist Michelle Grossman is standing by with the latest forecast. But first, quickly, let's go to NBC News correspondent Maggie Vespa in Newcastle, Kentucky. Maggie? Maggie, the destruction behind you is incredible. We know that at least one person has been killed there in Kentucky. What else are we learning about the victim? Yeah. 
So, Gotti, his name is Brady Delaney. He was 19 years old, and his family says that he was just driving. And the governor says he was driving as well, basically, when this storm first swept through. He was a local kid, graduated high school around here, played soccer, and his family just says he was loved by so many. So just the fact that these storms turn deadly, just adding another layer of complexity and just devastation, as if as if that's needed, right? I mean, look at the kind of destruction that we're talking about as a result of these mm. tornadoes that roared through. This was a garage, was, past tense. If you look inside, you can kind of see the pickup truck that is now effectively trapped in there and kind of peeking out. What's even more insane is the house on the other side of this is actually untouched. The man who owns both structures says he believes it's because he prayed as these storms came through. We also earlier met a mom who says she was watching the storms, said I'd seen storms like this before, I wasn't that worried. It was like she wasn't worried until she was. The wind suddenly picked up and she realized her two middle schoolers, a boy and a girl, were upstairs on the second story and she realized it was time to take action. Take a listen to this. We just sat down and all of a sudden the wind started picking up and we went to go look outside and the rain was kind of going sideways. And I was like, we need to hit, um, go downstairs. And we were just running down the basement and that's when we heard the pop and the roof came flying off. We weren't even in the basement yet before that happened. They weren't even in the basement yet. They didn't even make mm -hmm. it downstairs. We actually, though, I believe, have photos, if we can show wow. them, of what the kids' bedrooms look like today. Like, there is no ceiling, right? There is no roof. If those kids had stayed on the second floor, it's horrifying to think what could have happened. So obviously, Gotti, hats off to Lisa and her quick thinking, because again, outside of the death that with that has now been confirmed in this storm, there were only minor injuries. A lot of people saying that they miraculously made it out unscathed. This is one example that we're hearing here as they begin to take in kind of the damage that they're now having to deal with and, and clean up. So just exhausting, uh, exhausted people here uh, knowing what they've been through. Yeah, I mean, how are the power outages right now? I know that there's still a major issue. How many people are still impacted? They're a huge issue. I mean, obviously, cleanup is issue number one, right? Power is almost kind of number two. It's like a close second. 12,000 plus people tonight here in Kentucky still without power. The man in this house told us he just got it on a few hours ago. Another reason why he considers himself so lucky. But we've been talking about it. The storm has been charging east, right? And as it goes east, kind of the power outages are spreading. We're seeing a lot popping up in Florida and in Pennsylvania. And when you take in the entire country as a result of these storms, we're talking more than 350,000 people across close to 10 states, a lot of them in like the Midwest, kind of the Ohio River Valley, but again, moving farther east, north and south. So again, those power outages across uh, multiple states, close to a dozen, going to take days potentially to get back on. And that includes here in Kentucky, where again, they're just starting to clean up this mess. Got it. Maggie Vespa, thanks so much. And let's bring in NBC News meteorologist Michelle Grossman. M Michelle, this storm system is, is huge. What are conditions like right now? Hi there, Gotti. Yeah, it's huge in size and it's huge in impact. We've been tracking the storm for a few days. We're going to continue to track it over the next couple of days. We're still concerned about severe weather. That threat has come down considerably, but still could see some isolated storms as we go throughout the next couple of hours, and we're going to completely take away the severe threat. We're also looking at damaging winds, winds gusting up to 55 miles per hour, bringing down power lines. We have a slew of power outages. We have some trouble in the skies as well. We had turbulence in Tampa that you know, uh, sent two people to the hospital. We're also looking at flooding rains. So this storm is not over yet. What we're going to see tonight is a coastal low. This is going to intensify. So we had that cold front come through. It's making its way off uh, the coast here, but it's kind of for, it's making its way with this area of low pressure. So they're forming and they're creating a powerhouse. They're bringing in colder air. And then we're going to be talking about a nor'easter in April, up to two feet of snow in portions of northern New England. So that would be tomorrow. Showers circulating from the Great Lakes into the Mid-Atlantic. We had a lot of snow in the uh, Great Lakes. That's going to continue. Blustery and colder conditions in the northeast. A lot of people without power. A lot of people will lose power over the next couple of hours because we're going to see the winds really picking up with this nor'easter. And it's going to be well below normal in terms of the temperatures. Let's talk about the severe weather first because we still have 10 million people at risk. We could see winds gusting up to 60 miles per hour with any storms, damaging hail an inch or larger. A few tornadoes are possible, but for the most part, that is weakening. We could see a strong thunderstorm or two. The likeliest spots would be where you see this yellow here. We had tornado warnings earlier. They have since expired. We had tornado watches. They have also expired. 
Also down in portions of Florida, we could see a couple strong storms, but most of that is off the coast at this point. Now the wind, this is going to be a big problem over the next couple of hours. We're really going to hear it pick up as we go throughout uh, midnight, 1 a.m., 2 a.m. local time. 32 million people impacted. We have a wind advisory. That's where you're seeing the blue. A high wind warning is in the purple, and we could see winds gusting up to 65 miles per hour. Keep in mind the ground is so saturated, it's not going to take much to bring branches down, trees down, power lines down, created those power outages. So we're looking at that as we go throughout the next couple of hours as well. Flood alerts are in place to 39 million people from portions of the Ohio Valley into the Northeast. We're talking flood watches. That means we're, uh, conditions are ripe for flooding. And then we have flash flood warnings. That is in the maroon here for Philadelphia, Pittsburgh. And that means flooding is happening now or it's imminent. And flooding is very dangerous, especially if you're out and about in a vehicle. So as we look at winter alerts, we're looking at 7 million people impacted. We talked about the Great Lakes, especially the UP of Michigan, had blizzard conditions. We're looking at snow uh, winter storm warning there that is in the pink we have some along the Appalachians as well and then look at this into the interior parts of the Northeast into New England this will be the big story as we go throughout tonight into tomorrow and also Friday because we're going to see heavy wet snow up to two feet in the highest elevations of northern Maine but even a foot of snow in some other spots and that's going to bring down more trees more branches more power outages and we're going to see temperatures very very chilly there uh, so we'll watch that very closely this is what's happening right now still really active on the radar. We have all these colors here. The reds, the oranges, the yellows showing us where that heaviest rain is falling and it is pouring in some spots. We're talking about torrential rainfall over really saturated grounds and notice this revolver. It looks like that sit and spin, you know, that the kids use and it's going over the same places. So that's why we're getting those saturated grounds. We really have had so much rain in the past couple of weeks, if not months also. You see that cold air on the back of it? That's where we're seeing the snow falling. That is the blue. The lighter blue, the whiter blue, is where we're looking at the heaviest snow falling. And we're going to see this all shift off to the east. But notice we're looking at some purple, too. So we're getting that heavy snow with sleet, a considerable amount of sleet on top. And that will cause treacherous travel conditions. We're having so many troubles at the airport with low visibility. This is going to add to it as well. And it's not just here today with the uh, airports or tonight. We're looking that all up and down the east coast into the Great Lakes. We'll watch that again as we go throughout tomorrow. Rainfall forecast. We're looking at January anywhere from a quarter inch to a half inch in addition to what we already saw. And we saw a lot last night into uh, this morning. But look as we look into New England, we're looking up to three inches of rain in some spots and a whole lot of snow in portions of northern New England. Back to you. That is almost a full week of wild weather. Yeah. Michelle, thanks so very much. Sure. And don't go anywhere. We are just getting started. Up next, NASA is revealing plans to build a moon buggy for its Artemis mission. Those details and more stories trending tonight are straight ahead. Plus, most people are on the clock from like nine to five, but some bosses think they're available 24 seven. Well, here in California, a new bill would put a stop to after hour calls from your supervisor. Steve Patterson is going to be here to break that down for us. And later this hour, there's this ongoing battle between AI and artists. How do you prevent the tech from regenerating copyrighted material? Well, a team from the University of Chicago may have figured out a poison pill. Take on the AI machine. Oh my, oh my God, that doesn't look like anything. <laughs> Hey, welcome back. There was just a hearing today over that controversial Texas immigration law, and more on that in just a minute. But first, here are some of the other headlines we're watching tonight. Voters in Oklahoma decided to remove a city council member over his ties to white nationalist groups. A Judd Blevins lost his seat by more than 250 votes and will be replaced by Cheryl Patterson, a former teacher and longtime Republican. And book lovers, beware. A Texas stay-at-home mom was surprised to find out she couldn't renew her driver's license because there was a warrant out for her arrest. And what was the warrant for, you ask? Well, overdue library books. Woman says the library sent notices to the woman's old address and she never received a phone call about the late books. And the library says she owes them 570 books and now she's planning to battle it out in court. And Disney shareholders shot down activist investor Nelson Peltz in an effort to win seats on the company's board of directors. Now, investors voted to re-elect all 12 of the company's backed board members, including CEO Bob Iger. The defeat for Peltz ends the most expensive corporate proxy fight in history. And it seems like the list of recalls is getting bigger and bigger, and now cookies are the latest to join that list. 
FDA is recalling macaroons sold by the grocery chain Lidl, specifically deluxe branded macaroons labeled Party Edition, and that recall was issued due to undeclared allergens that the FDA says could lead to, quote, life-threatening allergic reactions. And NASA. Its newest moon car could be on the way today. The space agency announced three private companies to design the rover that Artemis astronauts will drive around on the moon. Only one company will ultimately get to make the moon buggy for the Artemis 5 mission, which is scheduled to launch in March of 2030. And the fate of SB4, that controversial Texas immigration law, seems to still be up in the air. That bill was back in a federal appeals court over in Austin today, and lawyers for the state of Texas, as well as the Biden administration, laid out their cases today. Now, SB4 was passed by the state's Republican-controlled legislature back in December, and this is what it does. It allows local cops to question, arrest, and charge undocumented immigrants suspected of crossing the border illegally. And it also empowers judges to deport them to Mexico, regardless of the country that they came from. Now, the Biden administration sued the state of Texas, calling the law an overreach, but there's been a lot of back and forth and no decision has been reached. And NBC's Homeland Security correspondent, Julia Ainsley, has more. Scotty, if it's felt like a lot of whiplash on SB4, that controversial Texas immigration bill, that's because there has been a lot of back and forth over whether or not that law could temporarily go into effect or be placed on hold for a short period of time. What this appeals court heard today is the constitutionality of the law. They're going to determine whether or not this thing will stick in perpetuity. And you can bet that whoever wins, the loser will appeal to the Supreme Court, who will ultimately decide whether or not SB4 remains the law of the land and that Texas can actually enforce immigration law rather than it just being in the hands of the federal government. But something really unusual happened in court today. Gotti, we heard the Texas Solicitor General said maybe Texas went too far, that what they tried to do was look at the president, figure out what the Supreme Court would not allow states to do, and walk just up to that line without crossing it. But he said maybe Texas did go too far. And in fact, he suggested a different scenario for enforcement, where rather than actually taking these migrants back into Mexico, they would take them to a port of entry that's still on U.S. soil and hand them over to Customs and Border Protection. That's vastly different than what SB4 laid out, which was to give Texas the ability to deport migrants, migrants from any nationality, not just Mexicans, back into Mexico. And it's something that Mexico was vehemently said they would not accept. They see their negotiations on who they'll take back as being something that they work out with the United States as a sovereign country, not individual states within the U.S. So what we're hearing now is that it could be that Texas reworks this law in some way that would not actually lead to the deportation of these migrants. It's something the three-judge panel started to ask the Justice Department about. Would the federal government consider that a violation of their rights as the federal government when it comes to enforcing immigration law? It was a hard question for the Solicitor General for the Justice Department to answer because this isn't something he's seen in writing. It's not something that's in the law. It's not something that's been filed to this court before. But he said that he thinks that that would still be in violation of the law because it's coming down to policing powers, local and state police enacting these powers that should, in the case of the Solicitor General, he argues, should remain with the federal government. So a lot more to watch in this case. Unlike a lot of these other decisions on the stays and whether or not this can be in place for a short period of time, this will actually take more time because now these judges are going to have to consider not just the constitutional arguments, but also this new version of SB4 that Texas presented today. Gotti? Sounds like a reworking of that law in real time. Julia Ainsley, thank you so very much. And coming up, don't you just hate it when you get a call or a text from your boss when you're off the clock? Well, a bill here in California is hoping to give workers more of a work-life balance. We're going to explain that. But first, you got to see this. A patient tried to escape a hospital in good old Albuquerque, and it did not end well. Stephen Byers was arrested on a bunch of charges, and before going to jail, police took him to the hospital for some chest pain, and that's where he tried to make a getaway. He went through the ceiling during a bathroom break. Police found him tucked under some insulation. He is now behind bars, and hospital staff say He caused something like $20,000 in property damage. Turns out, trying to get out through the ceiling, not the best idea. We'll be right back. Hey, 
Hey, welcome back. Uh, Bill here in California could make it a hard no for your boss to contact you after work. More on that in just a minute. But first, here are some other stories happening out west that we're following right now. Congresswoman Lauren Boebert from Colorado was hospitalized earlier this week after experiencing severe swelling in her upper left leg. Uh, doctors were able to surgically remove a blood clot and insert a stent. She's expected to make a full recovery, but she was diagnosed with a rare condition known as May Thurner syndrome. And security cameras in Los Angeles caught this woman on a car vandalism spree. You can see her smashing the cars, parked windshield here using a brick. The owner of that car had no connection to the woman, and it's unclear what caused her to target the cars. Investigators are still trying to ID her. And staying in L.A., check out these mountains of trash surrounding this home. The garbage piles wrap all the way around the house onto the side of the yard into the back patio. Apparently, the homeowners were fined back in 2016 for that buildup, but neighbors say the situation is only getting worse. A city official says they are working to clean up that mess. And today, so many of us Americans are looking for that new American dream of a perfect work-life balance, right? But with work from home and today's technology, it seems like you're always just an email or a phone call away from the workday. Well, now there's this new California bill aiming to restrict employers from contacting their workers during off hours. That law would follow in the footsteps of those so-called right to disconnect laws that have already made headlines overseas to fight employee burnout. You know, the ones that uh, are in countries that are testing out a four day work week. Well, NBC's news uh, correspondent Steve Patterson is here with more. I feel so bad about talking about this with you. Yes. Because you're always on the clock. I mean, this is not fair that, you know, there is the possibility <laughs> that bosses may not be able to call you on your off time because there's no off time for you. Yeah, my wife was like, isn't this great? And I'm like, babe, this does not apply to me. It doesn't apply to you. Imagine, though, you are done anchoring this show. You go home and you're like, you know what? I'm just going to turn off my phone because work can't text me. They can't call me. They can't email me. Nothing. Turn That's exactly. Your phone. That's like yeah. turning off your hand. I like, know, right? Good night. Yeah. I would feel so crazy. Like, I wouldn't be able to manage it. But for people that have, let's say, corporate jobs or even jobs, Jobs where you work for yourself or privately, uh, it applies to everybody in California, or at least it would, as a proposal from this guy, uh, Bill Haney. He is an or Matt Haney, excuse me, the assemblyman in San Francisco. He's proposing essentially that you are allowed to disconnect. All things considered, you, they're your bosses can't get in touch. Uh, now, I think what gets lost in the headlines is a lot of people are seeing this as like this authoritarian right. California thing, of course, where like you work a nine to five and then like the, the state government is like, well, you know, outside of that, uh, businesses can't do anything to their workers, especially right. if they're, let's say it's a place that is trying to push for something more or one of these tech firms that needs workers to work more than they would a nine to five. Um, that is okay, because according to Haney, you outline your business to whatever you need for your employees. So let's say your employees and the employer agree to a longer period than a nine to five. Just as long as you're within that and you make it clear and you outline it, that's okay. Uh, and I think that's what gets lost a little bit in this. But you can adjust it if you're an employer to whatever the needs of the employees and the business is. So in this brave new world, yes. what happens if your boss violates this <laughs> law? Like, who do you we call the governor and say, hey, sorry, the my boss keeps calling. I mean, and that's the other thing, right? Like, there's no way you can really authentically enforce this to the letter, like, every time it happens. It would have to be, like, over time, all these employees are saying, hey, they're not following the rules. Or they keep telling us that we have to work when we don't have to work. If that happens over and over and over again, and it's a repeat offense, then yeah, they can contact the, whoever is in charge of overseeing this, which I don't know how this Government would function. HR, Government I HR, guess. I yeah. guess, and be like, hey, um, <laughs> my boss isn't following the rules, right. and then the, the boss right. will get fined, and your company will face fines. Now, is this just for phone calls or, I mean, like text it's messages? Everything. It's to, so yeah. emails? Yeah. Pagers, Pagers, all the stuff. No, but seriously, <laughs> it's not just phones. It covers everything. I mean, and, and but again, it, it is the specification because part of this, part of the bill, and remember, it's just a proposed bill. It's it's not in effect. It's not anywhere near taking effect. But if it were to be in effect, then yeah, you would outline with your employer 
what exactly that constitutes. All of that is sort of flexible, according to Haney, who proposed the bill. But yeah, that can encompass literally anything. Like, they literally can't contact you if you're out of the building. I Sounds can't wait good. to see what contracts for people like us I mean, look like in for, the future. Uh, you I mean, and I don't uh, yeah. have to worry about this <laughs> at all, bro. Okay? I when we both this, first started, yeah. and they messed it. Like, they thought they were calling me when yes. they were calling you. And right. at 3 in the morning, you and I were very confused. Those calls yep. are just... Uh, Hopefully, far away. That's what you get up for this job for, right? <laughs> I mean, Steve Patterson, thanks so much, bro. See you, bro. Thanks. And there's another local law, this one a bit more contentious, that's dividing those that live in the city of Philadelphia. And it's over ski masks. Well, when the bill passed last December, officials said they were going to start handing out hefty fines left and right, some up to $2,000, but it's been almost four months. There's still no plan to enforce it, and they haven't issued any fines. Those who support the ban say it'll help curb crime, which critics argue unfairly targets young black men. NBC News stay tuned correspondent Marquise Francis has more on that debate. That ski mask may be the reason that somebody did not notice them and did not open fire. Sometimes people don't want to be seen. Sometimes you put a mask on to make you feel comfortable, you and your own little world. Philly is all about survival. So, I mean, if you don't know how to survive, then I don't know how you're going to live in Philly for a for... Putting an affirmative, the bill passes. In an effort to curb crime, Philadelphia passed a law late last year banning the wearing of ski masks throughout public spaces. We move forward and we make progress as a people and city when we remove our masks. Yet critics note there's no data that says banning ski masks will reduce crime. In fact, violent crime was down in 2023 as compared to 2022, according to city data. Property crimes during the same period, however, took off. More than three months since the ban became law, there have been instances of authorities asking residents to remove their masks on public transit. But police have yet to enforce the law or issue fines in public spaces, according to local officials. This has sparked both confusion and anger amongst residents. There's a lot of adults around the city who say, I do get a little weary when I'm walking down the street and I see someone walking towards me with a ski mask. And so what do you say to them who say we actually like the ski mask ban? Just because you have a ski mask, that does not mean you're going to commit a crime. Mm -hmm. And I think us putting a correlation between the two is definitely problematic. Like a, Some residents to told me the ban makes them feel more the safe in a city seemingly struggling to contain crime. When people be walking out here with the masks on, like some guys be trying to come in here, you got to tell them no, because it's not comfortable for me or the clients. But for others, particularly young people who often wear them, they say the ban compromises their survival. I have a ski mask on. I didn't cause any harm to anybody. I don't plan on causing harm, any harm to anybody. Philly, you got pick your poison. Like 19-year-old Liam Washington, who says the ski mask is much more than a fashion accessory. He says it also keeps him from being a victim of mistaken identity, which he says could put him at risk of violence. Oh, you got to either walk around and protect yourself or walk around and be a victim. What prompted the ban was how ski masks have been worn by criminals at the center of multiple deadly shootings, including the death of 15-year-old Devin Whedon who was on his way to school last May when he was fatally shot during a fight by three people, one of whom was in a ski mask. No one has been arrested or charged in the killing. Sit down. The victim's father told me he supports the ban. If we can go with a solution with this, I'll tell you this, a lot of crime will go down. Because you can't catch nobody if you don't see nobody. But many teens say not everyone who wears them is a criminal. So we're creating a situation where a subset of folks feel safer and another subset of folks are pushed into unsafe situations in fear. Like, whose fear, whose safety is more important? The official behind the new law says banning ski masks will make the city safer for everyone. This bill was created because we can't just have no face, no trace. So what do you say to a young person who says, I feel safer with this ski mask on, I don't feel yeah. safe without it? If you don't feel safe without having a ski mask on, we have a larger problem in the city of Philadelphia. And Marquise joins us now. Uh, Marquise, I have to ask, what is the point of passing a law if cops aren't going to enforce it? Absolutely. I, I think that's kind of the magical question for a lot of people in Philadelphia. Um, I asked Councilman Anthony Phillips, who we just saw on the screen, you know, 
why is this not being enforced? And he mentioned to me that right now uh, there's a new police commissioner and the police have been tasked by the new mayor of the city to prioritize uh, community policing. But I also spoke to both legal experts and uh, Philadelphia ACLU PA attorney Solomon Worlds, and he actually believes that this mass ban opens the police department uh, up to possible lawsuits. And he feels as though they're trying to buy time to figure out how they are actually going to enforce it. And I think even somewhat of an ironic anecdote, as I was going into City Hall to speak to Councilman Phillips, I passed about half a dozen police officers on bikes and they all had on ski masks. And so when you have so many people in the city wearing ski masks and kind of some loose laws around where you can and can't wear them, um, it begs the question, you know, how is this actually going to reduce crime? And Philly isn't the only city to pass a law like this, right? Absolutely. I mean, across the U.S., you have 15 states that ban mask wearing um, in some way, shape or form, according to the Free Speech Center. Um, New York and uh, Washington, D.C. also had a ski mask ban on the books for a number of years, and they were actually repealed um, due to COVID and people having to actually wear masks. Um, and then most recently in Atlanta, they also tried to impose their own uh, ski mask ban, but it was actually shot down in their own city council because of opposition to residents. And so we're seeing just this tension all across the country. People want to do something to curb crime, but other people asking, okay, are we going about it in the right way? Marquise Francis, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. And health officials have their eye on Texas right now as bird flu cases there are on the rise among flocks of chickens. NBC's Morgan Chesky breaks down the new health concern and the potential impact on consumer prices. Yeah, Gotti, these new cases are troubling for everyone, but particularly those whose livelihood comes from raising the chickens that uh, us grocery shoppers rely on. We are here in East Texas, uh, standing just outside of a barn, holding upwards of 14,000 free range chickens. And the owner tells us even though he has security measures in place, he's fearful of what one infected bird could do to his entire business. <laughs> Tonight, the American agriculture industry on high alert as a series of troubling new cases of highly infectious avian flu hit poultry farms, dairy producers, and now people. The nation's largest egg supplier destroying nearly 2 million chickens after birds at one of its Texas facilities tested positive. It's highly dangerous to humans, although it has never been shown to be easily transmissible between people. Now, the first U.S. case of a person suspected of catching this version of bird flu from a cow has been reported in Texas. Officials say the patient, a dairy employee who worked near infected cows, wasn't hospitalized and experienced only minor symptoms. The news comes as the highly contagious bird flu has spread to dairy cattle in at least six states. <laughs> At Cedar Ridge Egg Farm outside Dallas. It can spread anywhere. Owner Raouf Wahid all... has strict safety measures in place for his 14,000 chickens, but the risk remains high. If just one of your birds gets infected with avian flu, what happens to the flock? They will all be destroyed. Officials say the risk to human health remains low, but stress eggs or poultry should be cooked to an internal temperature of 165 degrees to kill any bacteria or viruses. The most immediate impact, though, may be to your grocery bill. Egg prices, which have already doubled since 2020, could be inching higher if this current outbreak continues to spread. Now, officials warn that backyard or even pet chickens are at risk because of any wild bird that flies over them carrying the virus could potentially pose risk of infection. Uh, but they also do not suggest that this is all the start of a new pandemic. Send it back to you. Yikes. Bird slash cattle flu. Morgan Chesky, thanks so much. And still to come, an American tourist is dead after being attacked by an elephant on an African safari. We've got that story and more headlines from all around the world coming up next, so stay tuned.
Hey, welcome back. A court in Uganda has upheld the country's sweeping anti-gay law. That story in just a moment. But first, let's take a quick look around the world. President Volodymyr Zelensky has signed a new law that lowers the draft age for Ukraine's army, taking it from 27 to 25 years old. Now, the idea here is to help replenish the country's battering, battered military. And Ukraine's army has about a million soldiers, while Russia's army has about a million and a half both are now fighting Europe's largest conflict since World War II. And Iran is saying it promises to punish Israel, blaming it for a deadly strike on the Iranian embassy in Syria. Iran's president says that the strike will go not will not go unpunished. Monday's attack, which killed seven of Iran's Revolutionary Guard officers, has significantly raised the risk of a wider war in the Middle East. And Africa's youngest democratically elected leader is now the president of Senegal. 44-year-old Basharu Darmiri Fari was sworn in yesterday. Just a few weeks ago, the opposition leader was in prison on corruption charges. One of his first moves in charge, uh, first moves in charge was to appoint a fellow opposition leader as his prime minister. And Zimbabwe's president has just declared a national disaster due to that country's drought. The UN says the rainfall there in January and February was the lowest in 40 years, and it looks like drought conditions will limit the country's grain harvest to a fraction of what it normally is. The president says he needs about $2 billion in aid to help millions who are going hungry. And Uganda just took some steps towards implementing some of the harshest anti-LGBTQ laws in the world. Today, the Constitutional Court there rejected a petition to overturn those laws, which essentially means that the death penalty is now on the table for anyone convicted of what they call, quote, aggravated homosexuality. NBC's news correspondent Aaron McLaughlin has the latest. Tonight, Uganda's constitutional court upholding a majority of the country's notorious anti-gay law, which includes the death penalty for aggravated homosexuality, a law the Biden administration calls a tragic violation of universal human rights. I'm worried. I am petrified. Uh, given if the judges can give such a ruling, that means there's no protection for any LGBTQ person in Uganda. And I'm not immune to that. Activist Frank Mugisha, listed as a petitioner on the legal challenge that was rejected today, says they plan to appeal the ruling to Uganda's Supreme Court. He's been receiving death threats and is worried about what today's judgment means for the community. For Ugandans, it is now state-sanctioned homophobia. It is telling Ugandans, now you can act. Now you can hate on LGBTQ persons. So you're bracing for violence? Definitely. On Wednesday, the court ruled that some sections of the law do violate Uganda's constitution, including a provision that required mandatory reporting of homosexuals and another that prevented landlords from renting to the LGBTQ community. But the court deemed the rest of the anti-homosexuality law constitutional, including upholding the death penalty provision and the criminalization of homosexuality. It's a law that's overwhelmingly popular in Uganda. We will fight for our African culture. We will fight for our faith. The court called the law a reflection of the socio-cultural realities of the Ugandan society, even citing the U.S. Supreme Court Dobbs decision, striking down the right to abortion, pointing to how that ruling considered the U.S.'s history and traditions. In December, the U.S. government responded to the law with sanctions, including visa restrictions for certain Ugandan officials and reduced support to the Ugandan government. Tonight, the State Department reacted to the ruling. We believe that law undermines the human rights, uh, prosperity and welfare of all Ugandans. Activists are calling on the Biden administration to do more. Now in New York, Mugisha says he plans to return to Uganda soon. The whole entire world should be worried. And they shouldn't only be worried about Uganda, they should be worried about other countries. Aaron McLaughlin, NBC News, New York. Aaron, thank you for that. And we're learning more tonight about an American who died while on safari in Zambia. Now, you're seeing video here of the tourist's final moments when the elephant charged a truck and tipped it over. And Shaquille Brewster has more on this incredible story. <laughs> Dramatic video showing the moment an African safari turned deadly. A massive African bull elephant is seen in the distance running toward a vehicle full of tourists. Suddenly charging right at the group, eventually flipping over the entire thing with its tusks. 
The six passengers and tour guide inside sent tumbling over. One of those passengers, an 80-year-old American woman, tragically killed, according to the tour company Wilderness. Another guest was taken to a medical facility in South Africa for treatment, as four others were treated for minor injuries. The CEO of Wilderness pointing to the terrain and vegetation in a statement, writing the guide's route became blocked and he could not move the vehicle out of harm's way quickly enough. The deadly episode playing out in the Kafui National Park in Zambia. The massive 550,000-acre wildlife preserve is the oldest and second largest safari park in the world, a popular destination for people looking for an encounter with iconic African animals like lions, hippos, and elephants. The safari guide company promises a tour of, quote, one of the wildest, most pristine places on Earth. But journeys into the home of Africa's wild animals can come with risks. While elephant attacks are not common, videos of the animal getting aggressive with tourists have gone viral before. But in Zambia, the tour company says it is cooperating fully with local police and wildlife officials in their investigation, as local authorities work with the U.S. Embassy to get the American woman who lost her life back home. Jack Brewster, thanks so much. And before we go, it is time for the future of everything. And we are talking about with this whole surge of AI, companies have been using content without getting permission first, right? So now some artists are using what's called a poison pill to protect their work. We're going to explain how that works coming up next. So stay tuned. And it's not just musicians that are trying to protect their craft from generative AI, but painters, digital artists as well. And thanks to some scientists over at the University of Chicago, they might have a new tool to do just that. It's this data poisoning software called the Nightshade. And if an image with this kind of protection goes through an AI model, well, let's just say they are in for a big surprise. NBC business and data correspondent Brian Chung shows us how it works. Hello there. If you've seen Star Wars or Marvel, there's a good chance you've seen Carla Ortiz's work. She's plenty busy. Wake up in the morning, get to work, do sketches and paintings every day. That's my full-time job. Not only is Carla an artist, but she's also a huge advocate for protecting artists' rights in this new age of AI. She's part of a class action lawsuit alleging copyright infringement by several generative AI companies. A lot of it is basically the entirety of my work, the entirety of my peers' work, the entirety of almost every artist I know's work. And all was done without anyone's consent, no credit, no compensation, no nothing. In the meantime, she's protecting her work using a tool made at the University of Chicago, where a ragtag team of professors and PhD students are embarking on a very bold mission to poison artificial intelligence models. Nightshade is a research product that's meant to sort of uh, restore the balance, if you will, between uh, content owners and AI companies that are trying to scrape and download content for training purposes. Ben Zhao, Heather Jang, and their team are capitalizing off how AI models read images. For example, if you ask a model to create an image of a dog from scratch, it's going to look at hundreds, thousands, millions of photos of a dog to train itself on what dog looks like. Sean Chan shows us how things normally look in a popular model like Stable Diffusion XL. In this case, we asked the model to generate uh, me using a sample of 30 images we provided. The results, not terrible. These are pretty good. Um... I mean, I have some of these suits, so that's <laughs> okay. Yeah, I would say that's like a like an eighty percent, eighty percent for close, yeah, yeah, likeness. Enter Nightshade, which hopes to make that zero percent. Yeah. So Nightshade, the idea is uh, to take a image, to take a image that potentially used for AI training. Uh, we add changes, small changes to this image, so that the image looks similar to its original content, but to the AI model, it looks like something that's completely different. The software adds a layer of noise to my 30 images, enough to throw the AI model off, but not enough to be visible to the human eye. So here, as you can clearly see, there are some texture in the original one, but it got more or less removed or noised out. We feed these slightly altered images back into the generative AI models, and the results, well, oh my, oh my god, that doesn't look like anything. <laughs> I turned 
into a cat. The model don't see your face, and instead they see cat faces because of these small changes. For artists like Ortiz, it offers protection. It might be impossible to stop AI models from scraping her work, but with Nightshade, she can mess up the way they see it. Nightshade is an attack. Nightshade is just saying, hey, if you take this without my consent, there might be consequences to that. Stability AI, the company behind the AI we tested, did not respond to NBC's request for comment. Like other AI companies, they offer an opt-out that artists can use to request that their work not be scraped. Zhao says the goal isn't to make AI models unusable. It's making companies pay for the artist's work. They need to take in more human-created content. And if they're going to do that, then they should pay for it. And so this is trying to encourage them, if you will, to do that. One cat transformation at a time. You know, I mean, if you look really close, like maybe I do have some cat-like features. <laughs> <laughs> I always suspected that Brian Chung was a cat person, but seriously, who would have thought we would be having conversation after conversation of things like poisoning AI? What a weird era that we live in. That does it for us tonight. I'm Gotti Schwartz. We'll see you here tomorrow. But until then, stay tuned now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.